This is Jeremy Park, CEO of City Current, personally inviting you to Growth Current. Growth Current is our e-learning and online personal development platform with City Current. It's an opportunity to attend virtual events with global thought leaders, national guest speakers, and experts who can help you grow personally and professionally. It gives you access to success secrets, lessons learned, learning modules, and so much more. Subscriptions are only $8 a month and you can do bulk subscriptions for your team. Check out growthcurrent.co to learn more. Welcome to the Changemakers Podcast, produced by City Current and brought to you by Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance. This show shares personal stories and insight from those who are giving back and making a difference so we can learn and do the same. We cover life lessons, business advice, passion, and purpose. Now here's our host, the CEO of City Current, Jeremy Park. Welcome to the Changemakers Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Park. This podcast is produced by City Current. We're always honored to share inspiring stories and those who are powering the good so you can learn from them, be inspired by them, take their lessons learned, and we can go out together and make a difference. And so we are joined by Ed Gillentine. He is the principal and founder of Gillentine Group. He's the author of Journey to Impact, a practical guide to purpose-driven investing. See, you see already, he's a perfect fit for us in the podcast for Changemakers. And He's also the host of a podcast, Journey to Impact. So, Ed, how are you doing? Man, I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. So, we'll definitely dive into your book. We'll talk a lot about your podcast and guests and everything you're doing on that side, as well as the mission-driven work that you're doing. But let's start out. Let's just get to know you a little bit. So, give us a little bit of just where you grew up and about your childhood. Absolutely. So, I am, uh, I guess we're relatively rare, born and raised in Memphis, uh, back in the 70s. So I'm a 1974 baby, right? So Memphis has changed a lot, right? And, and candidly, back then in those early 80s, my formative years, you didn't want to go downtown. And we were really struggling with a lot of things. Uh, poverty, right? You think back to those really high interest rates and uh, just inflation and all that stuff. And, but I love Memphis. I've always loved it. I never really had a desire to move to the suburbs or anything like that. And so it's been really gratifying to see Memphis come. Uh, I'm not going to say full circle, but you go downtown now. It's cool. It's fun. Um, we got a long way to go. Don't get me wrong with a lot of our issues, but uh, it's been gratifying as a lifelong Memphian to see the change, the progress. What about brothers, sisters? Give us a little bit of vantage point. On yeah, the yeah. I've got, uh, I've got one brother. And uh, he's a lifelong Memphian after the United States Navy sponsored his tour around the world. Uh, lovely wife, Liz. And I got three beautiful children. Uh, one is in middle school, which is fun. And then I actually have a birthday this next weekend for my 10-year-old. And then I got a nine-year-old little boy who loves to fish, uh, which I do too. So uh, we, we have a lot of fun at our house. Uh, it's, it's quite busy. I'll put it that way. Well, besides the fishing, what's a family tradition that started with you as a young child, but you've carried through for your family? That's interesting. It's crazy. Okay. I'll let the cat out of the bag a little bit here. We celebrate Christmas on Christmas Eve. And that is because we had so many family and we were traveling around on Christmas Day. It became unfun. <laughs> so we said, hey, we don't have to do this anymore. We have Christmas early. And so uh, that was something that was really hard for me to get into, but now I wouldn't change it. And even as we're not as busy now uh, on Christmas Day, I don't think we're going back. <laughs> <laughs> What's something that on your end, when you look at your parents and for what you do today, are there any things that, um, that really kind of helped establish this mission-driven work, this this focus on making a difference and focusing on impact? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I'm glad you asked that because that's really insightful. I think parents have a profound influence. Um, and I think a lot of it is, is just lived out. And my parents were no different. Now we came, I come from a faith-based background and, uh, but I think it's the same whether you do or don't, but when I thought back on my childhood, especially while I was writing the book, I realized that giving a portion of what you had received, what God had given you, 
Like that was just never even discussed. We, it was never taught. My parents never sat down and said, you need to give 10% or you need to support the church. They just did it. And I remember the first time I got 20 bucks for mowing the neighbor's yard. Um, I got two, $2 bills and put it in the offering plate at church. So I think um, my parents taught me three things. Work is good. Um, it's healthy. It's productive. It gives you dignity. Um, and hard work earns money. And when you get money, it's not just for you. It's to help everybody else. And so those are things that I really don't think they ever sat down and said, here, we're going to have a lesson on whatever. I, I just watched them live it. Even we didn't have a lot of money, but they are two of the most generous people I think I've ever met. What's interesting is, and I think a book forces this, especially when it's a book that is kind of from your heart. So it's, it's, yeah. it's, you know, about your story. Many times to your point, growing up, you don't realize all these lessons that you're learning. And then you look back later in life and you realize, wow, so much of it, although it wasn't necessarily intentionally taught, it was, right. it was a byproduct of experiencing it growing up and being in that environment that really created this, this, this foundation to, to put you on the trajectory that you're on today. And so talk about college and obviously then how you got in this world of both investing and financial freedom, so to speak, and leveraging finances to make an impact. So talk about, carry that story forward. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I tell people, I, I feel like this idea of impact and wanting, wanting to help those around me somehow started really early. Like I'm talking five, six, it's just always a part of me. And then I mentioned mowing grass. There, there must have been some sort of entrepreneurial uh, spirit in me, although I never would have said that until maybe five or 10 years ago, because I feel like I'm pretty conservative. And yet I've started like my own business. <laughs> I tell people, so we're, we're in the investment business. And, and so <laughs> I tell people, don't ever come to me for timing the market, because we started our company in March of 08, right? And right after that, I mean, it went straight down. I remember sitting over here on the couch, just watching that TV and you're just like, Oh my goodness, what's going to happen. But I went into college and I had my life kind of figured out. I'm a planner. If you spend any time with me, you'll figure that out. I like to plan everything. Um, 99% of which never happens. So I want to do work for like a fortune 500, be a chief financial officer type thing. I was getting, I was, I was falling in love with finance as a tool, as a strategic tool, right? So in organizations, I believe money tells you what's important to them. <laughs> if they, they may be saying one thing, but where they spend their money tells you what's really important. Or you can, you can drive that strategy by where you put money. And so that was fascinating. So I thought I'd do the Fortune 500 thing. And so as soon as I came out of college, I went to work for a tiny little company here in Memphis. Uh, a lot of Memphians have heard of it and been in the store, Yarbrough's Music. And they had a um, they had a retail music side and a uh, commercial sound and lighting side. So I got to be the chief financial officer at the ripe old age of 22. Had no idea what I was doing, but Tony brought me in. Uh, he didn't pay me much because um, he shouldn't, right? I didn't know anything. Um, they, he did pay for my MBA. Uh, so I graduated from the now defunct Crichton College, and then I got my MBA from uh, Union University, and it was their first cohort program. So, Jeremy, I'm sitting in this cohort program. They only allowed like 24. I want to say like six of them bailed out and got divorced. It was that intense in two years. But I was sitting around with more mature 15, 20 years in business, like FedEx, uh, mid-level managers, uh, other C-suite and smaller. I mean, it was perfect for a guy that knew nothing about what he was doing. And that was where my, my trajectory shifted a bit. So I thought I'd be a chief financial officer, work at FedEx. I, I get it. That's naive. Um, but that's what my dream was. I'd take three or four weeks a year, go do uh, service trips, mission trips, and give away a lot of money. That's what I, I, that's what I thought I'd do. But I ended up working at a tiny company, which got me in the game a lot faster Learned a lot, a lot more, didn't make nearly as much money, but I learned you could give time, right? And I learned that people needed a, a strategic mind. And, um, and so I did that for six or seven years. And then a buddy of mine called and said, you know, I've got my investment financial planning company. 
would you consider coming and joining me? Cause he didn't like the small business side and I was really good at that. So we, uh, we jumped off the cliff and I want to say this was 0304 and worked for a, another firm here in the, in, in the city. And then we wanted to, I stumbled into it. It's the short version. Then we wanted to really focus on uh, high net worth individuals that wanted to do more with their money than just pile it up. And so our logo is heart wealth impact. And I think that's how it works. If you can get at the heart, then the wealth has a different, um, it becomes a different tool. And then it has crazy impact. I tell people all the time, you're going to have impact. Is it the impact you want? Right. And so we got into that. And so at the core, it's financial planning and investment management. Right. But Behind all that, and we spend a ton of time, how do we understand the client's heart? And I don't care if it's Ethiopia where we work or 38126 in Memphis. I don't care if it's um, St. Jude or the Orpheum. Everybody's got a unique, frankly, purpose. And so we want to help them find that, draw that out, and then build a strategy um, to, to, to best create impact. And where, where that was, that was my own journey, right? I was stumbling and then I'd turn around and tell people, Hey, I just ran into a wall. This is what you shouldn't do. And so my clients, it's a special relationship because they've, we've learned together. Right. And so I, I was making all sorts of mistakes in Ethiopia and working with some organizations in Memphis. I was still learning. Right. <laughs> and then now we have a niche where we help people all over the world doing impact. And uh, that's kind of how the book came out because, you know, I, I just kind of, frankly, it was more for me to, to, to get my thoughts organized. And so um, that's, I mean, I wake up this morning, <laughs> talk to a Senator's office, talk to a guy in Ethiopia, a couple people around the country. Uh, one was about uh, an apple orchard in Ethiopia and the sanctions and how that's affecting how we're helping people in rural Ethiopia. And the other is helping people like with their company and how they, um, they want to help their employees through the COVID insanity. Right. So, I mean, gosh, I get to do stuff every day, Jeremy. I, I'm just like, man, this is insane, <laughs> but I did fall into it. Well, but you fell into it and you were smart enough to recognize, okay, I'm going this way and then I can pivot over here and I can do this. So it's, 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 you, you fall into it, but there's also a recognition around purpose and okay, I can take this experience, learn from it, move over here, take that and grow from it over here. And so you still have to be cognizant, reflective and willing to grow from it to be able to make that impact, which obviously you are. We'll definitely come back to the book and talk more about that. But Talk about your efforts, because you mentioned it a few times in Ethiopia. And so talk about kind of that side of what you do. Yeah, let me get a running start to Ethiopia, because Memphis is a special place, right? Always in the top five uh, charitable giving per tax return, right? How the IRS um, tracks it. Usually in the top three, and we trade off, believe it or not, with Birmingham, Alabama, uh, and Memphis for usually the top two spots, Right. I think that's fascinating. And you think about a culture and, and Memphis has a lot of challenges. And I tell people, I, I feel like we have a, uh, I feel like we have a self-esteem problem in Memphis uh, as a city. Um, and oddly enough, I really feel like you got to tip your hats, your hat to the Grizzlies because since they've come as the, they've created some sort of buzz, right? But there's all these things going on downtown. Um, those things, I think Jeremy started Back in the 70s and 80s, when the businessmen of Memphis were trying to work with the government, let's get this stuff going. And finally, they just said, the heck with you guys. We're going to make it happen. And you've got some of the most creative um, philanthropists, some of the most creative social impact businessmen from the Turleys to the Barnharts to uh, Tom Phillips. I mean, um, Fred Smith. I mean, there's some really um, smart, creative people that look at a problem and they say, we're going to fix it. We know we're not going to get it right off the bat, but we're just not going to give up. And I, just like our parents, my parents, 
I think there must be something to that culture, being around those people, just hearing them. You know, you, you maybe you go to a high school graduation as a kid. Boring as all get out, but, but, but maybe you hear Alan Barnhart talk a little bit. You think, oh, well, that's a perspective I never heard. All right, so then <laughs> uh, I went to uh, – this is, this is kind of funny. Some friends of ours started an organization to help street kids in Ethiopia. This is the fast version. Uh, and when you're young and dumb, you can't get smart people like Alan or Fred or Tom to sit on your board. So what do you do? You ask your friends, right? And so they asked us. This is my wife's college roommate. And, um, and so we sat on this board. And, if, you know, we're learning more about Ethiopia. And so a few years in, they asked me to go down there and wear my suit to talk to the Ethiopian government because we'd been getting, given some land to help with the kids, but it was stuck in, you can imagine, like what, what I call the bureaucratic morass insanity of Ethiopian government, right? Um, which is not that different from the US <laughs> government. Um, and so I went down there and guess what, Jeremy? They were like, oh sure, here you go. And I was like, wow, maybe I can do, I, I'm, I thought I had to be down there wiping snotty noses and helping these street kids. What I did learn is they are so traumatized that a male figure coming in there actually makes it worse. And so I was struggling with, well, now I can't do anything. Well, like, how can I help? Well, I can wear a suit and kind of pretend to know what I'm doing. And, and so that, that trip worked out. But on that trip, I mean, my heart was taken, stolen by the street children of Ethiopia. And there's one little girl we still support. Her name is Sosina. She's a, she was nine when we met her. I think she's about to turn 20, 19 or 20. It just, it struck my heart. And so first trip, I'm like, all right, I'm going back to the States. We're going to raise all this money. We're going to change Ethiopia. That's Liz and I. And then you got 08, 09 hit. All the funds dried up because they're so dependent on US dollars. So then the next trip, I'm like, how can we build like a business? that's sustainable, that employs Ethiopian people uh, with Ethiopian brains. They're so smart, right? Um, Ethi uh, that, that celebrates Ethiopian culture and get this, this was surprising to most people, uses Ethiopian dollars, Ethiopian burr. We don't wanna make money and take it out. We just wanna keep growing Ethiopia so that then we can have a place for these street kids to potentially go work. So from there, we, I would go down and I would, um, if, if exploratory trips comes up, We'll hear more about it, but um, I would go down under the guise of like a medical mission trip, but I would sneak off and look at businesses. And I went all over the country. A buddy of mine, John Osier, a longtime Memphis family, but John's a good buddy and invested over there with us. We would just sneak off and go look at business. We probably looked at 15 different businesses. Uh, we thought we were going to do pure water well drilling, uh, but the corruption in that industry was insane. Um, so we backed out of that. We just couldn't get comfortable. We got way down the road on chickens to the point we were about ready to make a capital raise. Uh, but then we ultimately ended up with apples. And so we have maybe uh, Northeastern Africa's largest commercial apple orchard, um, certainly in Ethiopia, probably the only one, right? It's a low bar. Um, it's about uh, 150 acres. I think that's 60 uh, hectares probably 45, 50,000 trees. It's a high density thing, produces, uh, God willing, uh, full production, about a thousand tons of apples. They're importing, believe it or not, they're importing all their apples basically from Seattle, which is insane. So they're really expensive. And we're employing 150 people that had no jobs. We, we picked, stumbled into a very impoverished rural area. And um, I mean, it's been amazing. Uh, we employ 55% women, which is unheard of over there. And when we went to the village, we employ most of the people in this village. Um, but the men were like, yep, we want the jobs. And we said, well, <laughs> you got to earn them. And so the women are better. They just are. Part of that, I think, is they're driven by we've got um, even through COVID when we paid them, um, when it, we couldn't really work, right? That was our commitment. We've got a solid income coming in. So when the dude wants to bolt to add us, the big city, and the government decides to randomly raise school fees, they can take care of it. I mean, it's blown my mind what God has done. And I have to say, you know, God has done it, but they've got jobs. 
the joy that they have working there. Um, Dignit. I mean, all these things, Jeremy, are amazing. So the goal there is to, um, with the profits, fund Ethiopian NGOs that are helping street kids. And now we've realized one of the best things we can do for impact is to start other businesses that employ people. And um, I'm, I'm blown away by how it works. But I promise you this, um, if you were to go back and talk to the three of us that had this initial vision, um, never saw it coming. Now, again, stumbled into it. But you see something, you chase it down. You see that, you chase it down. You're like, oh, that was a terrible idea. Let's go. So that's it. Well, but it goes back to even like you said, for the entrepreneurs, you know, the Fred Smiths, Pitt Hydes, I mean, all these amazing Barnharts, you know, these names that are iconic in Memphis and the Mid-South, like you said, they're smart enough to realize we may not have everything on the front end figured out, but as we go, we're committed to the mission. We're committed to make a difference. We'll figure it out. Yep. Same thing on your end. It starts one place, but you're smart enough to realize we're committed to the mission and we're going to figure it out. And it leads you in the right direction, which all of a sudden then creates these tidal wave opportunities of impact. Yeah. Carry that forward to the book and then we'll dive into some of the main principles from the book, but talk about the book. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> a friend of mine uh, um, really pushed me, Hey, you should write a book. Right. And I'm like, why do I want to write a book? Right. First of all, I'm not very smart. Second of all, I'm not a very good writer. <laughs> and third of all, who wants to read what I have to write? And so he kept after me for six months or a year. And finally, uh, he made me mad enough, actually. He was like, what, what really gets you fired up? He's kind of pushing. I was, I was standing right here talking to him on the phone. I remember this, I guess, three years ago. And I just kind of exploded. And when I finished, you could tell he was like, mm-hmm. See what I've been telling you. And right at that moment, it clicked, it clicked to me. Wow. I just spewed out like eight chapters. And then I started realizing, well, uh, Alan and, uh, and, and Pitt and, 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 and Tom were so gracious to share their mistakes. Uh, Alan and Tom do a lot of work in Africa. And I mean, they put all the cards on the table. I, there's no telling how much money and time they saved us. And, um, and Memphis is like that. You can call almost anybody up and they'll share their mistakes with you. I think, I think the impact community is that way. You go back to what you said, people that are so focused on the mission and don't have egos, they don't really care who gets the credit. Um, so anyway, I thought I've made a lot of mistakes. I'll just put them in the book. <laughs> and so I started writing and, and it came out of that. And then I start looking back at my story and asking what, how did I get here? Nobody sat down and said, do this. Right. But then you start thinking about your parents and you start thinking about your pastors and you start thinking about your teachers. And then you go on a trip. Maybe the guy that influenced me the most in my philanthropic philosophy, I guess, very rarely talked about his giving. He lives in Nashville in his eighties now. And for some reason, I, he sort of took me under his wing. I, I don't, uh, again, I'd have to give credit to the Lord um, for that, just that relationship. But he taught me more about giving just by spending time with him. And um, and so a lot of those things uh, fleshed out mowing grass, <laughs> uh, having my brother, like I would talk him into buying the G.I. Joes and the Legos that I wanted so I wouldn't have to spend my money. And all these mistakes and and things that I learned from people and then uh, you know, I was able to go to Russia. I remember that in high school, right after the Iron Curtain came down. Um, and, and, and you may not be old enough to remember this. I mean, the Cold War was kind of a big deal. And all you saw on television were amazing athletes, booming businesses, and those big parades through Red Square with the big missiles. You, you still YouTube it. But I always thought Russia was this powerhouse. And I went um, over there and you realize, wow, once you go behind the curtain, it was, it was broken. Um, and I realized the power of economics of business and that's what they needed. Right. Never quite got the free market concept. I, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. So I did, I, I went there and then going to Africa and stuff, um, 
you just see, and, and it's my gift, right? There is a 100% place for nonprofits. Um, I think about what uh, the Gates Foundation has done for AIDS in Africa. I mean, I, all, the, all the smart people were saying Africa is going to be gone, devastated, you know, by the late 90s. And so you get these retroviral drugs over there. But to get them out in that, uh, those massive quantities all over. So I know there are pockets, but basically, certainly in Ethiopia, but across Africa, there's no reason to die of AIDS anymore. Right. So I think so. So what I'm saying is that there's there's room for nonprofits. There's room for the arts. Like I'm passionate about the arts because I think a lot of times and I've never heard anybody at St. Jude say this, but you can sort of imagine my point. If you're not doing pure water well drilling in Africa and saving kids from cancer at St. Jude, you are wasting your money. Why would you give it to the Orpheum? Why would you give it to the Lincoln Center in New York City? Oh, that's a terrible way to look at it. Because who, um, if those kids and their parents need a break at St. Jude, where do they take them? They take them to the Orpheum, right? Do you, to get away from the pain, right? From all that they're going through. Well, you don't have the Orpheum without a bazillion dollars or the donors giving to it. And so, I, you know, I think through all that, it shaped it. Everybody's unique. I was good at business and I like inevitably, Jeremy, if I see an organization, they'll come to me and say, hey, how can I do this better? I always look at it. How can I make this as a self-sustaining for-profit enterprise? That's just, that is a lens that must be, I don't know, glued on my face. I don't know. Um, and occasionally I'll try to force it in and it won't work. And I'm learning now, okay, it doesn't work for everybody. It's a good lens to look through but don't forget to come around here and look through this lens. So I think uh, all of that sort of got plopped into the book and there's a chapter on um, like signs of success that I've seen. And it talks a little bit about focus and strategy. And then there's a chapter on warning signs. That's got the, uh, the uh, rich know it all in there, right? We've all run into that person, but they were a uh, uh, long story short. It was basically just me watching people making mistakes going back, being committed to the mission, being committed to saying, you know what, if I'm messing it up, I'm out of here. Brian Fickert's uh, book, When Helping Hurts, was is one of the best impact books. Uh, I think every nonprofit ought to read that. So um, yeah, that's how it happened. <laughs> Part of the book, and the book obviously is Journey to Impact, uh, A Practical Guide to Purpose-Driven Investing. You have six steps to align values, expectations, and finances in a way that maximizes impact give us a little teaser on those steps. Yeah. So I think um, the biggest one is think about your passion, your experiences and your skills. And it really is nothing more than the old Venn diagram. You know, you get your, your freshman year in college, but that really made sense to me. And I'll throw in a little baseball because I love baseball. Um, but if you think about your passions and your skills and your experiences and where they intersect. It is my observation that most people's impact sweet spots right there, right? Let me say that just because you're a doctor doesn't mean you're going to do medical mission trip, right? What it does mean is you will take all that knowledge you've learned and all those experiences you have. And if you go to do something else, it will come into play. And so when people are saying to me, how can I get involved? I'm not rich. Um, and that was a big deal for me. I don't have any money. So what do I do? Um, I just, that's where I learned, well, lots of, of organizations, especially on boards need time. They, they need people's time to guide. And so um, when I thought about, okay, everybody's got sort of this unique purpose, unique impact sweet spot. And if you can combine all of those things, it's a, it is a true sweet spot. I'll tell you a quick story that just popped in my mind. He's a local OBGYN, but he is an apiarist, a beekeeper. He's like the man because, you know, bees are a big deal. I didn't know this till we had an apple orchard uh, and the Ethiopian government, like carpet bomb sprayed all the bee, all the uh, insects in Southern Ethiopia. And we lost an entire crop, right? Cause they killed the bees too. So there's no pollination. 
And in, in America, there's like a shortage of bees. I read in the Wall Street Journal probably six months ago. There's like there's like bee crime in California because they take these big trucks full of bees to the almond farms. <laughs> Um, and I've always thought, dang, you better know what you're doing to steal a 18 wheeler full of bees. Cause that could go bad quick. So this guy's an OB- OBGYN, very successful, very good surgeon, but his passion is bees. If I were to introduce him right now, you would have to like, tell your assistant, call me and tell me I got to have a meeting. Uh, and I'm about to be late or he'll talk to you for hours. That's how passionate he is. Um, but isn't it amazing that he, by giving us advice, is having impact in Southern Ethiopia, right? Um, has he done medical trips? I'm sure he has. Is that what really fires him up? Mm-mm. Um, but he uses his knowledge of uh, genetics and uh, biology and all that stuff. It comes into play. So I think that's really important. Uh, I'll kind of, this will be my, my last little teaser because I do love baseball. Ted Williams, who I think probably the greatest hitter of all time, Um, This was before spreadsheets and uh, video, right? He created a little box and he tracked every pitch that he ever saw. And I think it's um, maybe seven wide and 13 tall. Uh, And and so he tracks his batting average, all these little baseballs. There's seven baseballs wide and 13 tall. And he colored it green, yellow, red. And so he knew his sweet spot. Pitch number one, if it was not in the sweet spot, he didn't swing. Pitch number two, Still needs to be green, but he, he's not waiting for the perfect pitch. If he's got two strikes, he's going to widen it out a little. I think the point there is find your sweet spot in impact. And here's the beauty of the baseball analogy. Ted's got to swing if it's close on a third strike because you can get called out. You and I, we can take all the pitches we want. So be patient. Um, wait for your pitch. Wait for your pitch in your sweet spot. Um, And then the caveat to that is don't wait too long, because if I could tell if if the book could do anything. I would want it to encourage people to get off the bench. Right. Do your planning, find your sweet spot, but don't be sitting here five years from now, um, not figuring out why we can't solve education problems in Memphis, because that's your passion. And you just you got to have a perfect plan. Nope. Do the best you can, but then get off the bench, take some swings. Here's the other good thing about the baseball analogy. You and I can't strike out. We can swing as much as we want. We can't strike out. And so those are a couple of things that I I hope people get out of the book. When you look at grading impact and putting more resources into what's working and making decisions that, you know, Hey, this one isn't over here as much as I'd like. And so when you start looking at that decision-making process around impact, what are some of the metrics that you're looking at? What are some of the questions you're asking? How do you frame that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it is one of the most difficult questions. Um, So I'm coming from an investment background. And so you do a ton of screens, right? And it's hard where that's difficult with impact is that everything's different and it's a lot more nuanced than a large cap value fund, right? It's even more nuanced than uh, buying game stock, which stopped because you saw it on Instagram. So one word that's important to me is, is it catalytic? It's one of my favorite words, right? To take something and blow it up exponentially. One of our interviews I just finished, we hadn't posted it yet, was the Child Advocacy Center here in Memphis. Catalytic, without a doubt. They have way more impact than the sum of their parts. So I'm always asking myself, is it catalytic? Now, this, uh, the second thing is um, this idea of, of um, percentage of overhead, right? I'm reading a book now called Delusional Altruism. I uh, can't remember the lady's name, but it's striking a chord because how many times have you heard, well, there's 5% going to overhead here and 55% going in this other organization. I'm going with the 5% because they're clearly managing it better. They could be, right? It's like any other sp- screen. It's got to be uh, um, just a piece. But if you're trying to teach um, – kids how to read, right? Because as far as I know, research still supports the fact that a second grade reading level is critical because you go second or third grade, you go from learning to read to reading to learn, right? 
Um, certainly true of our kids when that clicked in right, right in that area. So used to with reading programs, you would, um, you would, you know, want to take them to a 12th grade level, but that's not really, um, that's a lot of money for those extra, what is it, uh, 10 years or whatever. And so when you think about um, the cost of delivery there, what if your overhead is higher because you invested in software and humans to teach, not necessarily the kids? Well, if that gets lumped into um, overhead, if you will, administrative expenses, um, I would probably say in that case, that's probably a good use of money. You expanded your capacity, right? So I, I look at that overhead expense. Um, not everybody is set up like uh, World Vision or whatever, where you can funnel. Matter of fact, we tried to do that in Ethiopia, where you can say 30 bucks a month will go to this kid for vitamins and everything. It's really hard to do, but they've been able to pull that off. And so they give a huge percentage to, um, uh, to actually to the children. So um, I think as a catalytic, what's the overhead look like? And I like to look at, are, are they being strategic? Like, do they really have a strategy? Are they pouring into the, the research behind it? And then are they willing to make change? Jeremy, it is terrifyingly difficult if um, the Assisi Foundation here in Memphis comes to you and say, we're going to commit a quarter of a million dollars a year for you to make this change because you've submitted a good uh, thesis. We like this. We're behind you. And then you and I go out there and six, eight months later, we realize we got it wrong. Justin Miller, you know, Slingshot comes in and does some research and they say it's wrong. It is terrifying to go back to the foundation and say, time out. We really thought we were on the right track, but we weren't. And we're committed to the mission. And if you guys pull your funds, we understand. But, uh, but we have to tell you, we're not going to keep going down this road. We're just not. It's a waste of time and money. And I do think that's where funders can say, I appreciate that, Jeremy. We're, we're going to double down on you and find the mechanism that has impact. So those are a few things that I look at. Touch on this because what's interesting is you hear, especially for students, uh, young professionals, and you even alluded to this, like you want to go into philanthropy because of all the right reasons. Right. And then you get into philanthropy and you realize that just like everything in life, there's ego, there's politics, there's, you know, companies that as much as you want them to do it for altruistic reasons and leave it at that, they're looking at it from a, a lens of ROI. <laughs> you know, like, what's in it for me? I want to do it. But, you know, there's also consumers driving that social impact, employees driving that. So it's a necessity to do it versus it's just the right thing to do. There's all these layers of philanthropy that you kind of have to weed through. Talk about it from your vantage point of, of managing ego politics, the nuances of ROI. How do you view that? Yeah, um, great question. Um, I'll do my best. I'll, I'll, I'll just throw out my thoughts with the caveat that uh, it's a work in progress. Anytime I can stay away from a politician, I will. Right. They have they just have different pressures, no matter who they are, whether I like them or not. Right. They have different pressures. And the higher up the food chain you go, uh, you get into national politics, it's even uh, more challenging. So I try to stay away from it. <clears throat> but occasionally need, there needs to be policy changes. Um, I'll, pick, I'll pick on one that I think is a problem, and, and, and I don't have the answer, right? I can, but I can see it's not working. But uh, education, public education in our town, and I, I'm going to say in – most of the towns across the country is broken, not hopeless, but it's not getting it done. Right. Um, so how do you deal with that? I think when you got entrenched bureaucracy, you got to, I mean, think about academics. They got a million different great ideas. And one of the problems, I uh, got some good friends and family members that have taught in the Memphis city schools for years. I mean, holy smokes, every time you turn around, there's a new, um, uh, I'm not going to say fad, but a new idea well, educational ideas need 10 years to sort of germinate. And if you're changing them every three years, that, I, that just doesn't make sense. That's a policy level change. And you got to, 
you got to have perspective, really long perspective. That's what's going on in Ethiopia right now, right? They're making great strides, but it's still, it's a old, little old school communism coming out. Um, and so that's why when the current prime minister released 10,000 political prisoners from previous regimes, like I had no idea that's what that big building held. Um, and I shudder to think the conditions in there, but those, because he was committed to democracy, democracy, he let these prisoners go and they have turned around. One of them has tried to throw a grenade on him while he spoke at all sorts of coup attempts. And yet he's committed, right? But on occasion, especially after the old grenade, um, there were some crackdowns. And so I think with policy stuff, you got to give politicians, um, hopefully they won't listen to this because I, when I talk to them, I want them to get stuff done. But you, you got to give them some time to get stuff done. Um, I think the egos in, um, in philanthropy, um, that's tough because a lot of times you're dealing with wealthy people. Um, and, and I'm convinced, unfortunately, that a lot of wealthy people don't want to be thrust into that position of being the expert, the rich expert, you know, but everybody defers to them. Yeah, sometimes even if they're not rich, they, people think they're wealthy. And so they defer to them. And, and so they're just like, well, everybody's going to defer to me. I might as well get this meeting going. So they jump in and then it's like this self-fulfilling prophecy. But I think um, on the, on the um, organizational side, you got to be able to say, all right, Mr. Big Donor or Mr. Big Investor, that's not what we're here to do. And I appreciate that. I would say that a lot of those egos – I think this is true, Jeremy. A lot of them, if you push back, they appreciate it. They respect it. Um, and so we're, we're probably being a little harsh calling it egos. I do that all the time. It is what it is. But I think a lot of it is just they kind of stumbled into it. Um, but I do. I mean, you do run into somebody that, I don't know, you know, made $50 million building, uh, you know, metal buildings in the Delta and all of a sudden they want to come tell uh, the Dixon art gallery, what kind of art, you know, is good. Right. And we're having conversations with this guy about Michelangelo's David and Picasso's whatever. Right. And you're like, how did that happen? Right. I know you still read the comics in the paper. So uh, that is challenging. And I think you have to be gracious and I think, but you have to stand your ground. Um, I think those are, those are two big ones for a young person getting into like, how can I change the world? Give yourself time. Okay. So you got all the swings in the world you want at the same time, wait for your sweet spot, but no, uh, I'm starting to sound like an old man, Jeremy, that until you're 35, you're still figuring it out. Like you're still finding your groove. So if you're like, man, this just didn't right, at least try it. And then you either check it off the list. I promise you this, anybody that's listening, whatever you try, it's going to come back at some point in your life and, and you'll be making a decision. You'll be like, you remember that? And it's going to help, but give yourself time to try a bunch of different things <clears throat> and you'll learn. And then I think it just narrows down. Um, but for me, some, and this is not to say you can't do it when you're 15, like the girl doing climate change stuff. But I think for most people, you probably are 30, 35, and then you start to get fired up like you and I about stuff because you know I, I'm pretty confident I found my groove. If you're more than 35, I'm not saying that you've wasted time. What I am saying is look back and, and write your own book and see, wow, there's a clear trail there if I'll just take the time to look at it and then take off. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. Talk about the podcast and then we'll switch over and do kind of a lightning round. So talk okay. about the podcast on your end. All right. I'm going to go real slow. So it'll shrink the lightning around. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the podcast kind of came out of the book and uh, at first we were like, uh, well, it's good uh, information. And I have a couple of friends that are auditory learners. So we thought, well, well, I'll just, I'll record the book kind of, but with more stories. And then um I think the, uh, the guy that was kind of helping us with a little bit of marketing around Christmas, he's like, you need to do something different for Christmas, special. Uh, okay, what's that? Uh, how about an interview? Oh, 
okay, well, I don't do interviews. I don't know how to do this. Um, so I called Justin. I said, I thought, you know what? If anybody can carry me <laughs> in an interview, it'll be Justin Miller at Slingshot because he gets fired up. And so we did it and got this big response. And I learned nobody wants to hear me. They want to hear stories of people actually doing it. And so that's what drove it. And uh, um, it's been a lot of fun, especially for me. You know, one of the things that I, my little lightning round is only three questions. Um, but one of them is, what's a book you'd recommend? And so now my book list is getting big. And you know what's interesting? It's, it's never like a New York Times bestseller. It's always like what um, it's kind of off the beaten path, but it gives you insight into that person. And I, I would say the best part is you realize there are a lot of people doing a lot of cool stuff all over the globe. And uh, I haven't been able to get down to Ethiopia the day before or the day my trip, I was all packed up. They shut it down last year. And so i um, going to go back, God willing, later in the fall. But there's people doing, they're literally doing stuff all over the world. Um, and that was the best part of the, has been the best part of the podcast. Yeah. And, and I agree. I mean, that's the inspiring part too, is just like this podcast, when you start lifting your head up and looking around and seeing all the people doing amazing things, you realize, wow, what's possible. But two is the amount of people that are doing good and they're not seeking credit. They're just doing it for all the right reasons. And they're out there pouring their heart and soul in and, and really making a difference. And you realize, okay, I can do that. And two though, I'm not the only one out here fighting the right. fight. And I That's think in I both cases, it's doing. inspiring. Yeah. And, it, and yeah. it pushes you to want to do more and to make a difference. And, you know, that in and of itself, anytime you have a chance to see the impact you can make in someone else's life, that in and of itself is extremely rewarding, but it's extremely inspiring. And, and that's why you're willing to push through whatever wall it is that's in front of you to get to the other side, because you know how much it, it can impact others, but how much it, it motivates yourself. Yeah. And I would interject too, along those lines that um, when you think about how do we, how are we going to change? Like I think of Memphis and you've got economic uh, opportunity, you got uh, educational issues, you got poverty and you got race, right? How, how are we going to really get after it? I think the answer is real simple. It's you and I, right? It's one at a time engaging with our neighbors. No, don't worry about the credit. Um, don't worry about, you know, am I under an umbrella of, you know, whatever organization, just reach out to your neighbors because it's easy behind social media to say all sorts of stuff. But when I'm face to face with you and I realize you're a human, Lauren Young said when I that, that she learned really young with this uh, first organization that she worked with, the lady said, you sat on my couch. And that was the difference between you and anybody else. You have dinner with them. They become real humans. I know for us and I'll go back to Sasina, sweet, sweet little girl, right? Living in the slums of Ethiopia doesn't have a chance, right? And somehow we got in the raffle and she was our little girl, right? And so um, when I want to give up, if I have a Highland Harvester's file and there's probably been five times that I just want to throw it in. I'm, you know, I can't deal with it, right? Seems like Ethiopian government wants to, sh you know, shut everything down. You're trying to help their people. It's all these things. Um, but I have a picture of her and Every time I want to throw in the towel, I pop that picture out, Jeremy, because I remember that I may be dealing with millions of dollars and thousands of humans and tons of apples. But for me, there's a face, there's a name, and there's a story, and it's Sasina. And that's why we do what we do and when to go and get stuff. Because if it, if it was easy, I don't think it'd be called impact. Right. It is hard. I think about uh, what Steve does. Steve Nash does at Advanced Memphis. I think about what Lauren does with GIF. Right. Lauren told me that in the last three or four years, four of the kids that worked for her were killed. Uh, gun violence. Right. Four. Um, that stares you in the face. Right. So when the going gets tough, there has to be a face. There has to be a human behind it. And I frankly, I think that's where faith kicks in. You just got to keep going on. Yeah. Let's go ahead and switch over to a lightning round. So short questions, short answers. What do you like to do to relax? Oddly enough, uh, play golf. Okay. It, I, I just have say to fishing, but uh, I like golf. That's a good one. <laughs> do you try to get in all 18 holes or are you more of like nine holes and I'm good? 
Hey, I'll play three. <laughs> I'm so terrible. Like I'm just having fun out there, but actually I do love to walk nine. I have back problems. And so uh, I know that makes no sense. Playing golf is terrible for your back, but the doctor said, look, if it helps, bro, I don't know why it helps you, but do it. Uh, so I walk nine a couple of times a week if I can. And nice. uh, that's, that's good for me. So are you a stay up late or wake up early kind or both? Wake up early. Nice. Okay. Ethiopia has changed that because of all the dumb time zones. I was on a phone call with Australia, Ethiopia, New York City, and me the other day. And I finally gave up. There's this little app that's like keeps up with time zones. And I finally gave up and said, y'all just tell me somebody's going to be up in the middle of the night. I volunteer. Um, y'all tell me when to be there. But uh, I'm typically a morning guy. <laughs> Where do you and your wife like to go to dinner or on a date night? Southern social. All right. Nice. Okay. That's good. Now, you like to go outside or do you like to eat inside? We're, we're probably inside at that level. <laughs> With kids, we don't get to do it much. We've been trying to schedule a date for like six weeks right now. Um, but the, the Gillentine go-to is Las Deef takeout. Okay. Nice. Friday nights. You will find us at Lost D getting our takeout. And then we go home and watch the great British baking show. <laughs> there you go. It's Every, everybody's got right. the routines. <laughs> so where do you like to go on vacation? Um, we like the beach. We like the uh, panhandle and our new favorite place. You can, we're, we're kind of an introverted family and uh, we found a place in Fort Morgan it's like kind of a little resort and there's like two or three restaurants. And the main thing for me is an ice cream truck. And so we just go there. And uh, matter of fact, I, I ran into a bump writing my book. I just couldn't, I was stuck. So I said, Liz, can I go to the beach? That's where I go to chill. I, I don't like getting in. <laughs> I'm afraid of sharks. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I went down there, dude. And um, I hammered that book in like eight hours but I guess the beach just kind of cleared my head. And, but that's where we like to go, Fort Morgan, Alabama, of all places. It's beautiful. We chill out and eat like we eat copious amounts of ice cream. Nice. Nice. I like it. When you have guests come in and visit Memphis, where do you like to take them? Oh, that's a good question. Um, if they're meat lovers, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a central barbecue guy. Um, and uh, they just put one across the street. So uh, I would say Central, if they're barbecue, if they want like a Memphis experience, uh, like just fine dining, I think Iris is, is really good. Um, if they're more like me, uh, we're heading to uh, Gibson's. Now, I will stay up late for Gibson's Donuts. Um, and I've done extensive research all over the country, even in Ethiopia, which donuts are not a thing. They got their first real donut shop about a year ago. Um, but uh Warm Gibson's glaze without peer and my research all across the country for 10 years. Nice. Nice. Maybe that could be a, a, an entrepreneurial venture on your end is launching a donut shop in Ethiopia. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, <laughs> you can have your own I've, chain of donut shops. That's exactly right. I will say sweet Lala cinnamon roll is kind of insane. Oh, they are. Those are good. The good stuff. And her cooking oh, and everything God. else that they do is amazing. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> so what do you like to watch on TV? Wow, that's good. Uh, I'm kind of a documentary guy, although it ranges right now. I just finished a takedown of Osama bin Laden. I'm halfway through the pink, uh, you know, the rock person. I'm, I'm, I'm illiterate with pop culture. So pink. And then uh, the Nutcracker Ballet documentary <laughs> at the New York <laughs> City uh, Ballet Company. You got quite diversity there. That's, that's good. Uh, got, and, and I watch a lot of golf. <laughs> so you get such a, a nice insight into uh, everyone's life with this. Uh, some people say I'm, I'm crazy, but I like to see, I, li I like the word diverse. Well, you mentioned book. So what's a recent book you've read? Recent book that I've read right now, the, the one that I really like is um, um, Delusional Altruism that I mentioned. I think if I had to make, if, if somebody said I got three books to read for impact, I would do When Helping Hurts by Brian Fickert. Uh, that's more of an international touch. Toxic Charity um, is really, really good, especially it's out of a guy from Atlanta and Atlanta has a lot of the same issues we have. 
And then if you're going to uh, do any work in Africa, this book's not in print. It's really expensive. It's called African Friends and Money Matters, written by a um, college professor, I don't know, probably 40 years ago. And uh, it, boy, it helped me understand the different mindsets in um, what I would call high touch cultures versus us where we're just more transactional. And uh, boy, money is a big problem in uh, Africa relative to Westerners coming in. But I'm convinced a lot of it is simply we don't understand how that they, it's not as important to them as it is to us. And it gets us in a lot of trouble. You're creating your legacy every single day, obviously. And, and you know, you've you've come a long way and you still have so far to go. But what do you hope many, many years from now that people say about you and your legacy? I hope that um, my children will say that he loved us and he walked his talk. I hope that, uh, I hope that God will say, well done. And I hope that I will, um, stay committed to the mission that I think I'm called to, and then I'll let the chips fall where they may. Nice. Wrap up with contact information, website, social media, where do we go to follow you and your efforts? Absolutely. So um, edgellantine.com, I think is a, a, we've worked hard to make it a good resource. It's got a lot of book links, articles, white papers, that sort of thing. So I think that's really good, edgellantine.com. You can also uh, buy the book there. I mean, you can get it at Amazon. It's probably the easiest way, right? Everybody's got the little app. And um, and and it's also on um, like uh, digital, so iBooks or whatever. So you can get that there. Um Instagram is uh, Ed Gillentine. And um, that's, that's mostly where we, uh, we do a lot of sort of our, our, I guess, public outreach. And then occasionally I get to speak. And so that those, those um, opportunities are, are on the website as well. Well, Ed, greatly appreciate all that you do and uh, appreciate you coming on the show because you are a change maker. So thanks for all you do. And thanks for being a part of the podcast. Thanks for having me, brother. Thank you for listening to the Changemakers podcast produced by City Current and brought to you by Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance. To learn more about our guests and share your stories of others leading by example, visit us online at citycurrent.com or follow us on social media using at City Current. Please make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast wherever you listen. Now, think big, start small, and act now. Be a change maker.